Sing even when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You'll never stop, you'll never stop working. You'll never stop, you'll never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You'll never stop, you'll never stop working. You'll never stop, you'll never stop working.
the Lord, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, where fears are still. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in heaven. This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The, the wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ Hallelujah, here in the power of Christ I stand. As I did in the earlier service, I want everybody to do this. I stand in Jesus Christ, in him alone, amen. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved, but the name of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that it's not in works, that it's not in church, that it's not in any deeds. We stand in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And the song says, I'm his and he's mine forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you. Praise God. We have a privilege next Sunday night, August 26th. We're going to have our Sunday night prayer meeting in person in the building. Hallelujah. No more Brady Bunch Zoom for that Sunday anyhow. Some of you, you're younger. You don't know what that means. We so thank you throughout this uh, time when the church has been operating very differently. Thank you for your faithful giving. 
Uh, there are several ways to give. You can, uh, if you're here, you can fill out an envelope and leave it here. You can mail a check to the church. You can give online, uh, or you can uh, text B first to 73256. There's four ways you can give, and thank you so much for being faithful to this. Vacation Bible School is going to be taking place August 3rd through the 7th. The 3rd is a Monday. The 7th is a Friday. There's a 6 p.m. service on both of those days. It will be live. And the other three days will be uh, virtual on, on, the, on Zoom or on our, our Brookfield First site. I urge you to come on Monday, bring your kids, bring your family, get the goodies, and go throughout all the exercises throughout the week and to be back on Friday to celebrate what God has done throughout the week. One last thing, uh, if you're willing to volunteer for that to help, please text uh, Hannah Miller or email her or contact one of us. We'll tell her any way that you're willing to uh, be a part of that. The tag sale is August 15th for Christian Life Academy. Uh, we need your stuff. So if you have stuff that you need to get rid of, you'd like to donate to this tag, tag sale, please get a hold of me and I'll let Amy know I'm picking up several things that are bigger uh, tomorrow with my pickup. So if you have something that's too large for you to put in your car, give us a call. We'll come and get it. We also need volunteers. If you'd like to volunteer to help, that would be fantastic. See me and I'll let Amy know. With that, I'm going to turn you over to Pastor Phil for the precious preaching of the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. So great to see you all and wonderful to hear you singing and joining in together. It's, uh, it's good to be together to praise the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Psalm 122 said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I looked up that word glad in the dictionary. It means I was rejoicing. I was full of joy when they told me we could go to church. And uh, so that's great to see you here. If you're joining us online at home, we welcome you here today. We're glad that you're tuning in that way. And uh, time and space aside, we are all together as God's people, and it's great to be that. We're going to uh, come to the preaching of God's Word right now and turn back in your Bibles again to the Gospel of Mark. Just before I begin, we're going to pray together. I want to pray for you and for your family and let's open up our hearts and believe that God is going to speak to us today as we, as we read His Word and, uh, and have some study together in it. Let's pray. Father, thank You for all of Your goodness toward us. You keep us in the palms of Your hands. Lord, we thank You. Your Word assures us that we are constantly the, the focus of Your providence and love. Lord, these things are too wonderful for us. We should have been cast aside, and yet you have brought us near. We love you, Lord. Today, I pray for every family, those who are in the building here with us, those who are watching online. I ask for your very special blessing for each and every one. God, I pray that our families will be cared for. I ask, Lord, for your protection and your provision. Lord, we have so many things around us that would want to knock us off our feet and make us afraid. We pray, oh God, that you'd give us peace in the midst of the storm. We ask, Lord, that you continue to lead us forward in all of your purposes. Today, as we open up the Bible, we ask that you'd come afresh and speak to us from these timeless truths. This is not like any other book. It's your book. It's your word to us. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Change us forever. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's open up our Bibles together. And uh, we are looking for, as I said, the Gospel of Mark and chapter 5 today. Mark chapter 5. Uh, we are continuing our series through the Gospel of Mark called Dividing Line. Dividing Line. Okay, so we have come in our studies to chapter 5, and we're going to begin to read in verse 21. Mark 5, verse 21. Are you ready? Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, 
that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians, she had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who, her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. It's a great story, isn't it? And uh, it's one that no doubt is familiar to you. In fact, it's not one story. It's two stories. Because what we have here in this passage is another example of one of Mark's sandwiches. <laughs> if you've been with us throughout this series, perhaps you'll recall me talking about this before. It is a recurring feature of Mark's writing style that what he does is he, he starts to tell a story about Jesus, and then suddenly he interrupts the story and inserts another story. And when he's finished telling that story, then he goes back and picks up the first story again and finishes that one off. So there's an outer story and there's an inner story. The outer story is like the bread. It's like two slices of bread. But stuffed in the middle is the filling. The tuna salad, or whatever it is that you like to put on, on sandwiches. Whenever Mark does this, New Testament scholars refer to it as one of his sandwiches. Puts two stories together. Okay, so there are two stories intertwined here, which means that we are going to spend two Sundays on this passage. I'm going to begin to deal with it this morning, but we're going to come back again next week and, and deal with the same passage. Now, before we go any further... Just take a step back with me for a moment and let me remind you of what came immediately before this because the context is so very important. Mark has a clear purpose in writing down all the things that he tells us from the life of Jesus. He is revealing for us in this gospel who Jesus is. Jesus' true identity. And as we've read together, a sequence of events begins to take place in chapter 4. Jesus and his disciples went on a little field trip. Do you remember? <laughs> it was quite an exciting field trip. After a very long day of teaching the crowds of people, Jesus was sat in a fishing boat and he spoke to his disciples, and you remember him saying, let us go over to the other side of the lake. It was a lake. It's a freshwater lake. They call it the Sea of Galilee, but it's a, it's a lake there. And uh, he said, let's go over to the, the other side. Jesus was so exhausted from that full day of ministry that once they got out into the water, he fell fast asleep in the back of the boat. When suddenly... A ferocious storm whipped up, and you remember it kicked up the, the lake so that the waves were beginning to come in over the side. And they were in danger of sinking. So the disciples woke Jesus up. He was still asleep. They woke him up and they said, Don't you care that we're all about to drown here? But Jesus took control. He stood there in that boat. And he spoke to the wind and to the waves. 
And remember what he said. He said, settle down. He, he spoke to the wind and the waves and he said, peace, be still. And instantly, the Bible says, a great calm came over the whole scene. The wind died down instantly and suddenly the sea was like glass. Amazing. And the disciples turned to one another. And you remember what they said? They said, who can this be? Who can this be? Then the next part of the field trip, they reached the other side of the lake safe and sound. And then another heart-pounding episode began because no sooner had they pulled up in the boat on the shore, a wild man came running toward them. And, and I mean a wild man. He was demon-possessed. He lived his life in solitary confinement out among the tombs. And in fact, all the people from the nearby town were terrified of him. They had tried on occasions to chain him up to control him. But you remember, he would just rip the chains apart. He was so strong by the power of those demons. The demons inside him made him like a wild animal. But again, Jesus took control. He spoke to the demons. He confronted them there in that man. It turns out it wasn't one or two demons. He was being controlled by a whole legion of demons. But Jesus commanded them and they had to leave. They obeyed Jesus immediately. And what happened? The demons left the man and they went out and possessed a whole herd of pigs that were there nearby. It says there were 2,000 pigs and the demons went into the pigs, and, and the pigs went crazy. They ran down a steep incline and into the water, and they were all drowned. Now, you would think that the local people would have been amazed that Jesus had taken care of their wild man problem. And you would think that they might say, hey, Jesus, how long can you stay? We've got some other problems that you, maybe you can help us with. You know, he's not the only demonized man. We've got some other demon-possessed people, and we've got a lot of sick people as well. How long can you, can you stay and help us? But they didn't do that at all, no. Instead, they came and they begged Jesus to leave their area and not come back. So Jesus and his disciples got back into the boat, and they sailed across the lake again, back to their home in Capernaum. Field trip over. And that brings us to today's passage. Look at how it begins, verse 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. All right. So follow the sequence of events. It's important. As you read Mark chapter 4 and chapter 5, Mark has described a short two to three day window in Jesus' ministry. And in that tight little time frame, Jesus demonstrated his power over disaster, his power over demons, and as we're about to see this morning, his power over disease, and even his power over death. So that question of the disciples, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, that was just the beginning, wasn't it? Mark is telling us exactly who this Jesus is. He is, in these two simple chapters, in a three-day period, he is the great creator, commanding nature. He is the great Lord over the demons of hell. He is the great physician over disease, and he's the great savior even from death. Amazing. All of these things, one after another, demonstrated beyond any reasonable doubt if you had just followed Jesus around for two or three days. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So they arrived back in Capernaum. They got out of the boat and immediately, it says, <laughs> they're met by the crowds again. They're, they're swamped again by all these people. They had just been waiting, it seems, for Jesus to get back 
in the boat again. But suddenly, the crowd parted. And a man made his way through the press of all those people to get right up close to Jesus. People made a bit of room for him. He, he was obviously a VIP. But they also made room for him, not just because he was important, but because he was clearly upset. This man urgently needed to get to Jesus. The man's name was Jairus. And Mark tells us that he was one of the rulers of the synagogue. Every significant town around that area had their own synagogue. And each synagogue was run by a small group of men. And they were always very prominent men in their community, very respected men. Today we might call them the city fathers, the elders of the community. And they were looked to as an example in their religion. And they were usually wealthy men. So anyone from Capernaum would have known this man, Jairus. And they were not used to seeing him flustered. Because that's not how rulers of the synagogue carried themselves. They carried themselves with dignity, with respect. But he was flustered. It was an emergency. And he needed something from Jesus. Now, just pause there and think about this with me. Before this day, Jairus might well have been very conflicted about Jesus because he was a religious leader. And as such, he would have had a certain allegiance to the Pharisees. Everybody respected the Pharisees, the, the ruling class when it came to the everyday religion of the Jewish people. And he would have had an allegiance to them. If you've been with us, throughout this series, then you'll know that those were the guys, the Pharisees, who were deathly opposed to Jesus. They were against him. They did not like his popularity. They didn't like the things he was saying and doing. They were jealous, quite honestly, and they were afraid. And so they were always trying to catch Jesus out and turn people away from him. Well, Jairus would have had to have taken note of those Pharisees. They were very powerful people when it came to the synagogues. But at the same time, Jairus would have known all about the miraculous things that Jesus was doing. He would have been there on that day when Jesus burst on the scene in Capernaum. You remember the very first amazing thing he did in that town was when he cast a demon out of a man right in church. The guy manifested right in the synagogue, and Jesus casted the demon out of him. Now, Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. He most likely, surely, would have been there that day. And so he would have seen that amazing demonstration. And then after that, Jesus made the town of Capernaum his base of operations, and he had done a lot of amazing things there. It says that he stayed well into the evening, and he healed everybody who came to him. These were unquestionable healings, amazing things. And then his teaching, he had the multitude enthralled as he taught them with great authority. Jairus, as a leader of the people, would have seen and heard a lot of what Jesus had been doing. So I imagine that he might have been quite conflicted about Jesus. The Pharisees were saying one thing, and he would have felt the pressure from them. But then he was seeing a lot of wonderful things from Jesus as well. But however conflicted he had been, he put it all behind him this one particular morning. His daughter was very sick. In fact, he told Jesus in verse 23 that she was lying at the point of death. It's an interesting little phrase there because the Greek word is eschatos. When I was in Bible college, we did a subject called eschatology, which is the study of the last things, the study of the end. And here he says, my daughter is at eschatos. She's at the end. She's at death's door. Her life is about to finish. In a moment like that, things get real, don't they? 
In a moment like that, things get clarified in an instant. It didn't matter anymore to Jairus what the Pharisees thought of Jesus. Jairus had seen the power of God in him. Now, I I just want to talk to you for a moment. Listen, desperate times move people beyond theories and arguments and questions to cling to God, don't they? We could call this, I think, the gift of desperation. The gift of desperation. It doesn't feel much like a gift, does it? But it really can be. It never feels like it at the time. But whatever brings a person to call on Jesus, however horrible they might think that it is, it's the thing that will change a person's life forever and bring them to the very meaning of why we're here, and that is to know Jesus, to know God again. I'm sure you can relate to what I'm about to say. Isn't it true that there's a lot of people? In fact, I would say that there are the majority of people in our world today who give very, very little thought to God. Whether or not they would say they believe in God or not believe in God, the fact is so many people live as if God didn't exist. But have you ever known a friend or a loved one to suddenly enter into a very, very difficult season in their life they find out they have cancer or, or their marriage goes on the rocks or their child gets mixed up in drugs and suddenly, what do they tell you? They've been praying. They've been calling on the Lord. This man, Jairus, was desperate. He's in one of those moments of life. His daughter was dying. He did something in this moment that no self-respecting ruler of a synagogue would ever do in front of his home crowd. What does it say he did? He fell down at Jesus' feet. He threw himself at Jesus' feet. I hope the Pharisees saw that, don't you? I bet they were seething to see their ruler of the synagogue falling down at Jesus' feet. But he didn't care. He begged Jesus for help. And look there in verse 23 at the words that he used. He said to Jesus, my little daughter. You see that? My little daughter. Later in the story, right at the end of the chapter, we're told that she was 12 years of age. 12 years old. And that phrase that he uses to describe her is such an affectionate one. My little daughter. In Greek, it's a daddy's term of endearment. This is what he's saying. Oh, Jesus, my little girl, my daughter, she's at death's door. And when you come desperately like that to Jesus, how does he respond? Can I tell you, God never turns away desperate people. God listens. He responds. There was not a moment to lose. Jesus straight away went with Jairus to the house to see his daughter. But that's when the story gets interrupted. I mean, we're hanging off the cliff here for Jairus' daughter. But that's when the interruption comes. They were on their way and Mark drops in another story. Something that happened on the way to Jairus' house. Don't stop, Jesus. You've got to get there. Jairus is desperate. This little daughter needs you now. Don't let anything hold you back. But there was a delay. Now we read this other story. But it also is a story of desperation. That's the theme of this chapter. Desperation. A woman who also had to get past obstacles to reach out to Jesus. But just like Jairus, she was also desperate. Now, I'm going to focus on this woman for the rest of the time we have today. Don't worry, we will get back to Jairus' daughter. You'll find out what happens. But let's talk about this woman this morning. The first thing I want you to see about her is her condition. 
This is the first fill in the blank on your notes if you downloaded them. Her condition. Starting in verse 25 again. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. This woman made her way through the press of the crowd to get to Jesus. She was in a miserable, broken condition. Her life was full of suffering. Now, look at her suffering. Look at all the suffering she's going through. Firstly, she was suffering by affliction. She was suffering by affliction. That's the word that's used here, affliction. She was ill with a debilitating physical condition. And honestly, it's a delicate thing to talk about in church. It was a woman's condition. The Bible says that she had been bleeding profusely for 12 years. Watch that. 12 years. Think about it. She had been suffering with this condition for as long as Jairus' little daughter had been alive. Do you think that's a coincidence? That two times in this passage, Mark draws our attention to the 12-year period? Mark is drawing clearly a parallel for us between these two cases. We're meant to compare and contrast them. A couple of remarkable similarities and some significant differences between the two. Jairus was a prominent and respected man. This woman was anonymous and despised. Jairus was wealthy. This woman had been reduced to absolute poverty. Jairus was a leader of the synagogue. This woman wasn't even allowed in the synagogue. Jairus' home had been filled with a little girl's joy for 12 years. This woman had for those same 12 years been living in misery and despair. It was such an awful awful sickness that she had. In, in verse 29, Mark describes it using that word affliction. The Greek word is mastix. It, it means a plague. In fact, literally, it means a scourge. She had a scourge. The same word that's used when Jesus was going to the cross and they scourged him with a whip that ripped the flesh off his back. They beat him mercilessly. Here, Mark is telling us this woman has been mercilessly beaten by this disease for 12 years. She's scourged by it. So she's suffering from affliction. But secondly, she was suffering by prescriptions. She was suffering by prescriptions. It says she had suffered many things from many physicians. Now... When you read that word physicians, let's not think of them like our doctors today. They did not have in the first century the understanding of human biology that we have today. In fact, until very recently, relatively speaking, the, the, the 1850s and a man called Louis Pasteur, who you learned about in school, until Louis Pasteur in the 1850s, we didn't even understand the idea of germs and how they cause disease. The, these people in the first century didn't have microscopes. They didn't have machines so they could test the patient to see what was going on. They did not have medicines like they have today. In the first century, a lot of the medical profession was little more than quackery. I mean that. It was, it was, it was quackery. A lot of the medical profession, they could do a few things, but once things got complicated, their treatments were based in superstition. Very often, the cure that they wanted people to try was worse than the disease itself. They had painful treatments and often vile potions that they concocted up to try and make people well. You know, I've got to pause here because... 
It's a serious story, and it's a desperate moment, but actually what Mark writes here, if you know your Bible, it's funny. It, it, it's a, a, a humorous moment because Mark talks about these doctors in terms that are not very flattering. If you turn over in your Bible to the Gospel of Luke and read the same story in Luke's Gospel, Luke, remember, was a doctor by profession. And when he writes the story, he talks about the same woman and her suffering and and all of this, but he never mentions the treatments. He never mentions the doctors. He has too much professional courtesy for his colleagues that he won't criticize them. Mark doesn't care. He, He tells us exactly how this woman had suffered at the physician's hands. But here's a truth. In the first century... Just like today, even if you're not cured, you still get the bill. And this woman, it says, had spent everything that she had on doctors trying to find some relief. And finally, she is reduced to poverty. And because she's reduced to poverty, she's reduced to hopelessness. No more money for another doctor. Nothing else to try. She is hopeless and bankrupt. Apply this just for a moment spiritually this morning because a point is clearly implied here, isn't it? The solutions of this world will take everything from you with empty promises. This woman was left still suffering from her affliction and from all the world's solutions, from the prescriptions. Thirdly, she was suffering another way. She was suffering by rejection. And you know, this may have been the worst suffering of all. She was suffering by rejection. Because do not miss the cultural setting here. She was a Jewish woman living under the law of Moses. And if you go back and read the law of Moses in Leviticus chapter 15 and in Numbers chapter 19, this condition that she had of bleeding constantly, the condition made her ceremonially unclean. And that meant that she was not allowed into the synagogue. In fact, it meant more than that. Not only could she not go to church, she was not allowed near other people. She was to be kept socially distant from the rest of the community. You think we've had it hard for four months or so? She had it for 12 years from everyone. She would be pushed aside constantly. Don't come near us. She had become an outcast living on the margins of society. And I have some questions about this woman. I don't know how old she was. The Bible doesn't tell us. Had she never been able to marry because of her condition? Had she been married but had her husband left her because of this condition? The passage seems to imply that she had no one to provide for her. No provision left. And I wonder if she hadn't tried to touch Jesus before. If she's from Capernaum, if she's from that area, has she tried to touch him before? But he always seemed just out of reach, sitting in the boat, pushed out from the shore, teaching the multitudes that really didn't want her around. But now all of a sudden, Jesus was on his way with Jairus and he's coming to a place where she sees her opportunity that she can can maybe touch him. I, I was reading this story again this week and I was thinking about that old song that says this, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Here's this woman and she can't normally get to Jesus but while he's going to help someone else, She sees her opportunity. Listen, friends, don't ever presume that you can come to Jesus whenever you want to. If you feel the stirring of God in your heart, if you see your need of Jesus, that is the moment to respond to him while you can, while he's passing by. That's the moment. She had to seize this second to come. We don't know what's going to happen. We We can't count on the next beat of our heart. But she took this moment and she, she did what she could. So we move from her condition to secondly, her confidence. Her confidence. Verse 27. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd 
and touched his garment. Uh Uh-oh. She's not supposed to come near the crowd. She's not supposed to be around people. And she touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. The confidence of that statement. If I can just touch him, I will be made well. What is that? It's faith, isn't it? This woman has faith. A faith that wouldn't be stopped. Because actually, in that verse where it says that she said, if I can just touch him. You read it in Greek. It's in the imperfect tense, which means she kept on saying. She kept on saying. This is what she's saying to herself over and over. If I can just touch him, if I can just get to him, if I can just lay hold of him, if I can grasp him, because that's what the word means, if I can grasp him, if I can just touch him, if I can touch his clothes, his garment. Now, the Greek word for garment there is hemation, which is the outer cloak, the outer robe. The Jews wore what they called in Hebrew a shimla, a shimla. And, and it was this outer coat, and it was a very special robe because on the edges, on the hem of this robe, it had tassels. And I'm quite sure that Jesus had this particular robe on because he was one who perfectly kept all that the law prescribed. He was our perfect obedient servant. And in Uh, Numbers 15 and in Deuteronomy 22, it talks about this robe that the Jewish men were to wear. And uh, on the bottom of this robe, the, the, uh, the shimla was tassels or sesith in Hebrew. They were attached by blue cords. And they were very special because the reason God told them to sew them on their garments was they were meant to be a constant reminder of the people's covenant with God. They would wear these robes, so some hung down behind them, some of the tassels they would pull up over their shoulders. And and they would touch those tassels, and they would look at them. And every time they looked at those tassels, they were meant to remember the Lord always. And this woman kept on saying, that's what Mark tells us, she kept on saying, if I can just grab his tassel, This Jesus, the very reality and presence of God. If I can just hold that promise of the living God, I will be made well. That's her faith. That's her confidence. So what happened? Her condition, her confidence, thirdly, her cure Her cure. Verse 29. It says immediately. There's Mark's favorite word again. Immediately. Immediately. The fountain of her blood was dried up. Now that tells us something about the extent of the bleeding that this woman had experienced for 12 years. It's described as a fountain. The fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Literally, The bleeding dried up at the source. The very root cause was staunched. Can I tell you this today? God's healings are never merely a relieving of symptoms. A lot of the things that this world wants to do for you, it's just trying to give you some relief from symptoms. God doesn't think that way. If I can just get them a little bit more greedy, a little bit less greedy, a a little less... Independent, if I can get them, you know, a a little less angry. No, no, no. God's not dealing with the symptoms of our lives. In his whole plan of salvation, in every way that he meets us, God goes to the root problem. That's what he came into this world to do. Not just to relieve our symptoms, but to deliver us from the root cause. What's the root cause? Sin. Our uncleanness. Our impurity. We're separated from God by a gulf we can never span. We are locked up in the ways we behave because we are sinners. God came to deal with the root cause, the sin. This woman felt it dried up at the roots, at the very cause of it. She was healed, cured. And finally, number four, what came next? 
Her confession. Her confession. Let me read you a few verses here, starting at verse 30. And Jesus immediately, there's that word again, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But the disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Jesus said, who touched me? If you read it the way Mark wrote it, he spun around. It's abrupt. It's violent. He turns around. He says, who touched my clothes? Who touched me? <laughs> the disciples said, Jesus, Jairus' daughter, remember, we got to get there. This is an emergency. What do you mean? Who, who touched me? 2,000 people have touched you since the last block. A 1,000 of them were Arab pickpockets. Who touched me? Jesus says, no, that's accidental contact. Somebody deliberately, volitionally laid hold on me. Somebody reached out to touch me with faith. He says, for I felt power went from me. Now, I think we've got to be careful here. What it is not suggesting is that power passed involuntarily from Jesus, you know, like a battery that you stick a, a wire on and it short circuits the battery and drains all the power. That, that's not what this is describing. No, there had been a call upon him by real faith and Jesus met the need. He always answers real faith. And he answers this woman's faith by power. And, and he says, I felt power go from me. And, and he's looking for who it was that touched him. She was now fearful. Why was she fearful? Well, think about it. Her uncleanness. Under the law, even if her bleeding stopped, it would take seven days of examination before she would allow, be allowed back in the synagogue. Anybody that she touched in the meantime would be ceremonially unclean and would have to go through a whole ritual washing process. Okay? She's unclean. Her action, touching Jesus, had just made Jesus ceremonially unclean. He's not supposed to go to synagogue now. Everyone around her that she's pressed through would feel it. Listen, if Jesus had been one of the Pharisees, if she had touched one of them, they would have been livid. They would have been so angry with her. And so she's about to be discovered. Jesus is saying, who touched me? Maybe for a moment she hesitated because Jesus would not let it go. When it says Jesus looked around, it's in the present active tense. It's Jesus kept looking around. He kept looking around. He's not letting it go. He's waiting. Jairus' daughter is waiting. The crowd don't know what he's doing. But he's waiting. He's looking for this woman who touched me until finally she stepped forward and came clean and said, 12 years, an issue of blood. I touched you. I touched the hem of your garment. Why did Jesus ask that question? Who touched me? Is it because he's angry like a Pharisee? Does he want to harshly correct her? No, we see what happens in the story. He still has grace to pour out. He still has grace to pour out. And here it is, verse 34. Grab a big old marker. And underline it in your Bible. Daughter. Did you see that? Daughter. It's the exact same word of affection that Jairus used at the beginning of the chapter to speak of his little girl. It's the same word. Daughter. This is the only time in any of the Gospels that Jesus is ever recorded calling someone daughter. And Jesus says to her, daughter of mine, 
He gives her assurance of, of her future. He says, the root has been healed. Listen, the word here, when he says healed, it's the word sozo, which means you are completely set free. This will never trouble you again. He's telling her, her whole future has been taken care of and now she is owned in the household of God. Is this not amazing? The love of Jesus for someone who's desperate. What about Jairus' daughter next Sunday? Desperation will always reach the heart of God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Whether you're here in the room or you're watching online, I just want to challenge you about this story this morning. I want to ask you, have you desperately reached out to God for help? The Bible says every one of us is cut off from him the way we're born. But Jesus Christ came into the world and lived a perfect life and died upon the cross so that he could pay for our sins and bring us back to God. And there are so many symptoms of our separation from God, symptoms on every level. And we get so worried about the symptoms, but we never take care of the root thing, the sin that controls our lives. Have you called upon Jesus? Wherever you are, here right now with me or at home watching online, you can reach out to the Lord and in a moment, He will answer your prayer, forgive your sins, put the past behind you, and take you forward. And listen, all those other things he can take care of. The woman's issue of blood, whatever it is in your life that causes you so much disruption and pain, God can help you. He can bring you through. But have you cried out to him? Folks, maybe you've been a Christian for some time. You're walking with the Lord. But do you have a loved one or a friend? As you're reading this story this morning, that's who you're thinking of because they live like God doesn't even exist. Oh, we need to pray that in the desperation of their life, they will find the one who's just waiting to be reached out to, Jesus. Can we pray together? Right now, you can put all of your trust in Jesus. Reach out and grasp the promises of God like the tassels on that garment. Say, God promises me that if I call on Jesus, I'll be saved. And he will do it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing story. I pray for every person here in the room, those who are watching at home right now. I just ask, Lord, that you will meet us at our point of need. And God, no matter how simple the prayer, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would cause those who are reaching out to you right now to know that you are hearing them. And I pray, Lord, they would have the assurance that their prayer is being answered. Lord, walk with them and help them. Lord, walk with their loved one, their friend, and help them. Bring them to yourself. Bring healing and wholeness for the glory of your name, we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have done for us. Amen. Amen. We are going to share together for just a few minutes communion. We're going to come to the Lord's table. If you came in this morning and received the bread and the wine, if you'd just like to grab that. If you're watching online at home, maybe you've prepared to have communion with us, and, and we'd love you to join in with us right now. I just want to remind you of what that woman's affliction was like. The Bible calls it a scourge. And in the book of Isaiah, we are told that Jesus was wounded for our sins. He was bruised because of all of our sins. And it says, by his stripes, we are healed. The word healed there in the Greek version of the Old Testament is the same word as in this story of this woman. She was healed. Sozo. It means made completely whole, spiritually and physically. All of that was purchased for us when Jesus took the lashes upon his back, his scourge in our place. And when he gave up his life, he took away our sins completely and buried them. And when he rose again, he brought us newness of life. That's what these elements speak to us about. Now, can we pause for just a moment? Because the Bible tells us whenever we come and remember what Jesus has done, that we should examine ourselves. 
that we should recognize our impurity, our uncleanness. When we first come to Jesus, all our life is sin. And we need him to come and cleanse us. But you know what? Even as Christians, we fail God. There are weaknesses in our lives still. And this is a moment for us to come and examine our hearts and confess our sins so that we can find fresh grace and forgiveness. Would you do that right now for just a moment before we proceed? Look into your heart. Reach out to the Savior with me. Thank you, Jesus. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Apostle Paul wrote to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For us, Jesus did not suffer for his own sin, for he was without sin. He bore it all for us. Would you stand with me in his presence right now? And with thanks and worship for all that he has done. Let's eat together the body of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow for every person who comes. Thank God. And see that word that Paul reports that Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant What we are doing here this morning is we're reaching out one more time to lay hold of the tassels of his garment and say the promises that you made, the covenant that you have struck in your own blood, we are relying upon it. Jesus alone is our Savior. Let's, with thanks in our hearts, drink together and celebrate what he has done. Hallelujah. Come on, just say thank you with me this morning. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. We give you our praise and our worship today. Thank you, precious Savior. Shall we sing one more time? Let's lift our voices, lift our hands, and sing in worship to the Lord.
So teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Oh, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Jesus has become for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Everything that we need is found in Christ. I pray that you will go today in the strength that only Jesus can give, in his wisdom, his righteousness, his sanctification and redemption. And only let it be said of every one of us that he who glories Let him glory in the Lord. This week, let's live for Jesus. Let's give him all the praise until we see each other again. God bless you. Thanks for being with us online. Thanks for being with us in person. If you're here in the house, then we just ask that you slip your mask on. Make sure that we're mindful of each other in the foyer. God richly bless you. We'll see you again very soon.